Michelle Stanley. I am the founder and the executive director of Moksha Living, which is a holistic psychotherapy and life coaching practice in Washington, D.C. and in Los Angeles. And what we do is we help people to liberate themselves from that which is holding them back, which is actually your mind and your mindset. And how we do that is by combining psychotherapy and life coaching with holistic services like yoga, mindfulness and meditation. So I am really excited to be here with you all in ACD today. And what we're gonna be doing today is we're gonna be hearing from professional fighters regarding mental health awareness. And we're also gonna be hearing from mental health therapist, Dr. Sharifa al Udka and um, Amin Watson and Dr. Mercedes Ebanks. So I'm really excited to get us kicked off. and. We're gonna start by hearing from the first African-American female fighter, UFC, Mrs. Angela Overkill Hill. And before we hear from Angela, let's take a look at her highlight reel. My name is Angela Hill and I fight at Stroy at 115. Hand Hill. Lead a great covering up. Knees by Hill. I'm a Invicta FC champion. Oh, I was one of the first strawweights to be signed to the UFC, also one of the first black women to be signed to the UFC, and the first black woman to headline a main event in the UFC. Overkill, trying to get the win right here! That was such a great highlight reel, and so I just wanted to ask you, um, in your experience as the first African-American woman in UFC fighting, what challenges and obstacles did you have to overcome and how did those affect your mental health? Hey, um, nice to meet you or nice to see you again. Um, being, uh, being the first African-American anything is always a little scary. You know, you want to represent, you want to um, not just not just show how good you are, but show how good you as a people are. I, I feel like we all have a lot of um, generational trauma that we hold on to. And what it leads to is a lot of us wanting to be the best at what we do, um, even better, three times better than the best person who does it. So when you go into a sport, um, you try to be as perfect as possible. So I've always been a hard worker. I've always, um, you know, really gone out there and tried to do the best of what I did, never cut any corners. And eventually you hit a block. Eventually you hit a wall where it's hard to, um, it's hard to be continually successful. So um, just a little background. I, um, I started my career as a kickboxer, as a Muay Thai fighter, mm -hmm. um, went undefeated. And then my first pro MMA fight, I won and ended up getting signed to the UFC. So I'm in the UFC with one pro MMA fight and I'm fighting girls with a lot more experience than me. And I still did well, you know, I still did really well for myself, but, um, I ended up not being perfect. Mm -hmm. And it was really hard for me to accept not being perfect. And anytime I got a loss, um, it was just really hard thing. And I, I feel like it was harder because I had this pressure, I had these expectations, and I just wanted to um, make 
everyone proud, you know, uh, that I think that's the hardest part of being an athlete in losing is you feel like you let down your coaches, your family, your friends. And for me, I felt like I let down my race, you know, every time I'd step out there mm. and it didn't come out the way I wanted to. So um, that I think that was the hardest thing to overcome. Um, that and realizing the world wasn't rooting for me. Mm -hmm. Um, coming from uh, PG County is really close to you guys out in DC. Um, I felt like I was a bit sheltered when it came to the worldview of black people in America. So once I got into college, uh, I'm just like, oh, wow, things are a little different here. Like, uh, people believe in the stereotypes and mm. they think that I'm a certain way. And they're surprised that I actually have layers to my personality. And then, um, you know, the same thing happened when I went into the MMA world, suddenly people are rooting against me or people don't think I deserve to be there. Or they, they think, um, I'm there as a result of affirmative action. And that's mm -hmm. always been really tough for me too, just knowing that um, people weren't seeing my successes blindly. They always had, it was always loaded because of the color of my skin. So um, those are the things that, the mental health re things that have to do with, I think being the first of anything in, my, in, in, in a field or achieving the first of anything. Um, but then there's all the other stuff that just comes with being a fighter and being an athlete in general. Um, just, uh, there's so much, you know, when it comes to the performance anxiety, wanting to, um, wanting to train, even though you shouldn't, because your body hurts, um, just, uh, letting people into your circle that you maybe shouldn't have. Um, there's a, there's a lot of things that go with just being in the limelight and being a fighter that, uh, that anyone can relate to. So I think all those things are, uh, now being focused on a little bit more when it comes to sports, you have sports psychiatrists, you have um, mental coaches, but it's definitely a very new field. So I'm happy that things like your program exists because we need more of it and we need more accessibility to it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's <laughs> such a, that, that's such a robust answer. I, I like what you shared about, you know, competition is going to bring about comparison and being the first you're always comparing yourself right to those that have been there before you and it sounds like you know people that weren't rooting for you you're always looking to the outside and probably comparing yourself and being compared and mm -hmm. so I'd love to hear what did you did you see other people with challenges or going through their own challenges with mental health as you went through these things um, definitely. Um, I, I didn't mention this yesterday, but, um, I, I've had, you know, mental health, uh, mental illness in my family. Um, my brother, he was diagnosed, uh, bipolar schizophrenic when he was 21. Um, mm. and then, uh, I have, uh, you know, also addiction in a lot of my family. I think everyone can relate to that. Um, and these are things that people, sometimes don't see as illnesses they see it as someone acting up or someone mm -hmm. you know being hard-headed or not taking things seriously when in fact they are mentally ill and they need help you know they need uh professional help and i think things have gotten better now but uh it was a challenge when we were younger just like finding help or when i was younger finding help for uh uh my brother so it's it's like I'm happy the way that things are going now that uh, people are being more open about mental health issues and um, being more open about it in sports too. Uh, I've, I've had a few people in the fight world, like, you know, commit suicide or people who weren't diagnosed properly and ended up doing something that ended up getting them killed. Um, you, uh, you hear about it a lot in the sports world with, uh, CTE now there's, mm. there's, um, there's talks of that having a, a lot to do with your mental health and just, you know, creating issues that weren't there before just because of, uh, brain damage. So it's, it's really good that people are focusing on it now more because, um, 
it was really untapped maybe 20 years ago. It was an untapped field. People didn't take mental illness as seriously, um, especially in the Black community. I, I And I think it's more because you you couldn't afford to a lot of times, like you couldn't afford to take it seriously. You just had to push through. Like that's, that's like the model motto. A lot of times just push through the trauma, push through the hard, hard times. And eventually, you know, it'll, you'll come out on top, but it's not always that easy. So, um, so yeah, I think, uh, I think whenever I hear anything about mental health awareness, I'm I'm excited about it because I, I've been affected. Lots of people that I know have been affected. And um, it, it really is important to deal with it. Even if you don't feel like you have a mental illness or you, you're not really that far in the spectrum, like it, it's a thing that you need. Um, like we were saying before, um, you have your coaches for nutrition, you have your coaches for um, boxing and, and jujitsu and like grappling, wrestling, but mental coaching is something a little more rare that I think more new, more people need to embrace just to get through the day. It's a crazy world right now. And um, man, I can't even look at Twitter without wanting to call a, <laughs> call a therapist. So it's it's really important um, just to address it and not just shove things down because that's when you you start getting those more serious uh, effects, those effects of stress, anxiety, and all those things. Absolutely. And I love how you shared that, you know, at the time and even presently, there's not a lot of resources or support. And even if there is, there's a stigma around connecting to mm -hmm. mental health services and what you're told to do is is just push through which may or may not be you know the best advice so I'd love to hear if you have you know some tips or tools that can help other people you know specifically other UFC fighters or specifically African-American women to overcome mental health challenges um well it, it used to work for me um <laughs> but now I need other stuff but uh hitting things helped <laughs> and not just hitting things, but, um, but working out, breaking a sweat, uh, using your body, um, in the way that it was designed to be used. A lot of times we get stuck in these jobs where we can't really move around. We can't, uh, we don't have time to move around. We don't have, uh, anything really pushing us to, to sweat. And when I was, before I was a fighter, I started Muay Thai, um, which is kickboxing. I started that because I was stressed at work and because mm. I felt weak and small and I didn't feel like I could, you know, I, I didn't feel like I, I had much confidence and being able to just um, get physical with something and it could have been anything, but most of the stuff I found wasn't that fun. And I really enjoyed punching and kicking things. Who would have thought? <laughs> Um, well, you're right. That is actually a really good one. I mean, like, you know, of course, not 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 punching and kicking, you know, innocent bystanders on the street, but actually no. hitting things or hitting a bag is actually a really great release of mm -hmm. emotional tension, stress. It's actually really great for anger. And so, yeah, I, I love how you have how you use that as an example. Yeah, it's I, I didn't expect it would be that important to me at the time. I just tried it out for fun. Mm -hmm. And after going to my first class, I was just like, wow, this is amazing. I had those endorphins that you get after working out. Um, it could be as simple as going for a jog in the morning. And every time you go, like I tell people all the time, don't feel bad about not wanting to go because after you leave, you're going to be so happy that you went. You just get that rush, that that natural high from being productive, from doing something. It's, it's the same as being creative. That's another one for me. Um, making something that didn't exist before, mm. um, being creative. When it, it could be drawing, writing, anything, just doing something that, that works your brain and takes your mind off of the stuff that you have to do every day um but uh ab above all things I think I think talking to people um mm. just being open about how you're feeling and you can find someone who you don't know that well who <laughs> or you can find someone who you really trust just anybody uh who's willing to listen and not not even give you advice but just willing to let you vent and and get yeah. out your frustrations because a lot of times you'll you'll just be sitting there angry one day and you won't really know why. And mm -hmm. when you 
when you either write it down or talk it out, um, you get to work through why you're angry and why you're feeling a certain way. Um, I've never tried therapy before, but I feel like a lot of that is is part of it, you know, just the talking aspect is, is probably the most helpful part of it. Um, but, uh, you know, those are my home remedies, I guess, for, yeah. for, for mental health. Like those, those things have gotten me through a lot of rough times, just talking things out, writing it down, figuring out why I'm feeling a certain way. And, uh, that could, it could just help you from going, going from frustration to figuring out maybe a solution or figuring out how to just get through the next moment. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. And I think those sound pretty close to what a mental health professional would, would say as well, Angela. So I think you did, you did pretty good. Yes. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you so much. And just to review some of the things that you shared so that our audience can capture them. So, you know, we've got using your body and and I think that you're saying that you just don't want to keep it in, but you want to like get it out, even if it's punching, if it's exercising, if it's hitting, if it's moving. And then I love that idea about creating, that's a way to take something that's inside of you and like put it to the outside world so you can share it and can transform. So that's like super inspiring. And then I love just like talking to people. It doesn't have to be a therapist, just talking to other people. And, you know, speaking of talking, we're actually going to hear from another UFC fighter and Bellator star and former light heavyweight world champion, Phil, Mr. Wonderful Davis. And before we hear from Phil, we're going to take a look at some of his career highlights. Presenting Phil, Mr. Wonderful David. He's in huge trouble for it's over. Oh my God, you over that. Jason Arsaw giving the extra time when it was never in. It's dangerous everywhere. That's right. 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 Bill Davis finally got one in. Stryker goes in for a takedown against the wrestler. I think that hurt him. great highlight reel. I love, I love how, how it seemed like in one of those takedowns, you actually had a little air there. You got some height, almost looked like a little bit of gymnastics there. So let's see, let's yeah. bring on Phil. There you are. Accident. I was flipping. <laughs> well, it, that, that was, it was, it was amazing. That was, that, that made for some good, for some good entertainment there. So <laughs> it's great to have you. Thank you so much, Phil, for being here today. And, um, Good talking to you again. And so I know that you have a very unique story and I'd love for you to share that with our audience today. What are some of the experiences that you've had uh, in dealing with mental health, going back to your days as a champion college wrestler? All right, so uh, before I was a mixed martial artist, I was a collegiate wrestler and I wrestled in high school and junior high and uh, going into my senior year, uh, I was just, bombarded with pressure uh my junior year it was one of my best seasons and then i i just completely fell apart in the postseason Mm. and uh, i trained to get better all summer long and as september and fall season uh preseason kind of came around uh i just i just fell apart Mm. the the pressure of needing to win which it had never been that for me. I was simply having fun. I was wrestling, something I loved to do. I enjoyed it. And in the course, over the course of like, probably, you know, one or two weeks, I went from training two to three times a day to 
barely making it to a class a day, <laughs> telling my coach I can't make it to practice. And um, right away, my, my coach said, Phil, I think you need to see uh, the, the sports psychologist. It was mm. very, very, very not like me. And um, it, it was just... All right. Well, Are we good? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think so. I'm, I'm not sure what happened. But it's... <laughs> oh, my God. That scared me so bad. I don't know like, what I thought was about to happen. That was a sound effect <laughs> for the anxiety. Right? <laughs> Just a reminder. Yes. Um, for anybody watching, that was for dramatic effect. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's basically how I felt. That's basically how I felt. And so <laughs> I... Uh, yeah, I, you know, over a course of two weeks, I had just I had fallen apart. The the idea that mm. over the uh, the course of my young adult life, I had built myself into becoming the best wrestler I can be, and this is my last chance to win a national title. And I felt the pressure of this is your last chance, and if you don't do this, your whole life up until this point has been wasted. You've just wasted fifteen years of your life. Mm. Uh, wow. <laughs> Yeah, it, it was just a, it was just a lot to 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 a sit on, pressure. right? And then within me, um, I had this this feeling of, you know, almost that I instead of using that energy to to push me further and try harder, it almost felt like you should just quit. You should just mm. you should just not try, and. Um, Man, I, I'm not like a big crier. Uh, very few things move me to tears. And I just found myself, I, I couldn't read. I was just, I would just stare at the book. And uh, I really, I got, thank God we had a sports psychologist, um, very, very seasoned vet, um, just a really great person to talk to. Um, we probably had 10 to 15 sessions. And I mean, I, I, I think he not only changed my, my life in the immediate, but really laid down some, some foundation for some lasting habits to understand what pressures and feelings I'm having inside and how, how I encounter those and how do I make sense of them. Mm -hmm. I love I love what you're sharing because I think a lot of people think of anxiety as you know like the sweaty palms the racing heart but I really like what you share because it talks you're talking about the other experiences of ways that anxiety can manifest and also a lot of people think that anxiety is a result of like being like weak in a way or not having yeah. will or not having you know confidence and you had all of that you right. were at the top of your of your game right. and it still got you. And right. you know, the effects that you had was almost like you know, like not being able to read, not being able to focus. And, and it took another person saying, like, you are not yourself. Right. So just just one thing. You, Phil, you, know, you keep bringing these sound effects here. I don't know what that one was. But. You know, it's 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 like that, you know. <laughs> that 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 nails on the chalkboard, that's 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 the feeling. Yeah. You know, I also want to point out during that time, uh, I was the, the number one ranked wrestler at my weight class in the nation. And yet it still felt impossible to do the thing that most predicted that I might do. It, it, it was the pressure of so many things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I think that that's so important important because that's really what I'd say that anxiety almost creates creates a system over override where you're not able to do the thing that people you're that you can do that comes natural to you and uh oh the chat's going crazy I think somebody mm -hmm. has their their hand on it but there was a question for you up there that I want to make sure that I ask so the that, question that's was not it, is it? <laughs> we'll have to decipher that one but this one was uh did you ever feel like as a black male that you didn't want to see a therapist or admit that you were dealing with mental health? And I guess in light of that question, maybe you could also talk about, you know, if that were or weren't the case, what did you do to, to cope with the anxiety, either with therapy or without? Right. So um, let's start with that question and then we'll, we'll lead into yeah. your question. 
Um, definitely there was, a, I, I think there was a, maybe a cultural stigma around it. Um, and when we say mental health, it doesn't mean uh, that you maybe necessarily need medication or mm -hmm. that you are necessarily diagnosed with a, a lasting uh, issue. Mm -hmm. it, it simply means that, you know, you have uh, more on your plate at that present moment than, than you maybe know what to deal with. You have stressors that you're, you're not dealing with efficiently. And um, yeah, I, I was very reluctant. <laughs> I thought uh, this might be for people who or need more than I do. I, I have so much to be thankful for. I, maybe I don't need to be wasting this guy's time. Uh, mm. By the way, his name was Dave Eucleson. He's uh, a great doctor. I don't know if he's still at Penn State. I suspect not, but um, fabulous uh, sports psychologist. And, but um, some of the tips that he gave me were mm -hmm. really taking the time to think through exactly mm -hmm. Uh, what was bothering me and um, not only using that to kind of fuel my passion for wrestling but also uh, you know separating the real things from the fake things okay. um, when I was uh, in college some many years ago uh, Facebook had just become a thing it was uh, still the Facebook at the time if you are familiar and, uh, and so, you know, the way that people would talk about, it, it was the beginning, like forums were, were there, forums were around. And, um, you know, that's the first time you really encountered like a lot of people who, who would just dump bad information on your lap. Like, oh, this guy's terrible. This guy sucks, he'll never win. Like, oh, I go to this website mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, you really have to be able to, 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 to wade through that stuff. And mm -hmm. um, I know Angela is really big about keeping her circle small. And uh, to maybe just kind of touch on that for a moment, I only allow, you know, information from a, a set amount of people. So mm -hmm. if everyone says I'm awesome and I'm unbeatable, and I'm the best thing since sliced bread, all of that is great. And I thank you. However, I cannot ingest that information. I only need to hear from my team and those people can be critical of me and those people can give me praise. Those people can tell me I did a great job. Um, but typically those people say a little bit of both. I'm like, man, you knocked them out in five seconds, but maybe not your cleanest punch. <laughs> you know, right. so, uh, and that's the type of feedback I want. I need honesty and I need uh, people to be straightforward with me. And you know, as a side note, I think just having people in your life that are willing to be honest with you is always a, a good thing. Mm -hmm. Those are those are really good tips, and I and I know that yeah, that Angela and I had spoke about that yesterday. So I appreciate you bringing that back. You know about the importance of your circle and who you take influence from, and I think that you've given some really great advice to you know, that to people out there, whether it's African-American males or fighters or just the population in general. And I'd love to show the audience for now the um, one of the reels from when you won the light heavyweight title and when you had to defend it. And I think as we talked about it yesterday, that you had shared that you had actually been experiencing anxiety prior to this. Is that right? Oh, yeah. And so when, what we see on the outside can sometimes be really different. So I really just appreciate you sharing with the audience um, what was going on on the inside, because I think we often assume that we're the only ones going right. through that. Right. So, yeah. So uh, do, did you have a clip or no? Yeah, I think we've got a clip. Yeah, so this is, this is the clip of when you won the light heavyweight title. But the night was about 2.05, the long awaited light heavyweight world title fight it is rare, Jimmy, that a fight that you envision, a perfect game plays out exactly that way it did for Phil Davis. Yeah, we knew Phil Davis would have the takedown advantage, national champion wrestler, but his jiu-jitsu on point, passing at will against Liam McGuire. And once he was there, vicious ground and pound, threatening for submissions over and over again, keeping the champ on the defensive. And in our main event on Spike, 
it was a rematch between Phil Davis and Ryan Bader. Jimmy, Phil Davis, the light heavyweight champion. That's right, Phil Davis coming forward, trying to use his strikes. Ryan Bader having his moment with his straight punches. Neither fighter really finding their offense throughout an awkward fight. Ryan Bader getting a couple of takedowns, but not able to hold Phil Davis down. It was back and forth, a lot of angles, a variety of strength. Yeah, well, I know, I know, Phil, you, you're not coming back on now, but I just want to thank you for what you shared, and it was just really a pleasure to talk with you and to see this reel and for us to just get an inner glimpse into what's kind of underneath the surface um, of, a, of, a, of a fighter of, and that's just had to, as a champion fighter, so... I just wanted to say thank you one more time. And um, yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. So next we're going to hear some tips from mental health therapist, Dr. Sharifa al Udka. And so we'll go ahead and bring Dr. Udka on and I'll let her, I'll let her introduce herself and then we'll get into hearing some tips from, from her. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Sharifa al -Ukda. I'm a licensed psychologist located in Washington, D.C. Um, and I currently am also a professor at Howard University. And my not-for-profit is called Your Neighborhood Clinic. Thank you, athletes. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Angela, for sharing your stories. I think that you all have really highlighted a lot of the ways in which anxiety shows up for everyone, but also athletes specifically. It's very important to know that anxiety is one of the most common mental health illnesses that individuals will be diagnosed with throughout their lifetime. It is also important to know that the seeds of anxiety and quite frequently anxiety disorders can be diagnosed within children. Issues such as mutism or separation anxiety is quite frequent in children. And so a lot of times individuals may have the precursor of anxiety, which may build up um, as they continue throughout their life. One of the things that Phil um, and Angela talked about also that is important when understanding anxiety is sort of that pre-existing trauma that may exist where you have begun to think about things in a way that they have described as this pressure. And so all of a sudden, the excessive fear and worry about failure about evaluation, about not being good enough can sort of capsize our otherwise mental health and create an anxiety disorder. One of the things that Phil's story pointed out was the idea that anxiety very frequently is coupled with avoidance. So individuals will no longer want to show up, want to complete activities. They may stay away from friends and families that they once enjoyed, competitions, exercises that they once enjoyed, um, in addition. There also anxiety may frequently be coupled with physical symptoms. So the, the normal sweaty hands that Michelle talked about um, may be maxed if you're an athlete because you're frequently sweating, right? You're constantly sweating. You're constantly exerting your body. But the mental parts of that excessive worry and anguish about a future outcome will arise. One of the things um, that I also want to point out in terms of anxiety is that anxiety differs from normal transient fear, right? Like you may have a thought like, oh my God, should I get on this um, roller coaster? That is different from actual anxiety where it can be crippling and debilitating and is oftentimes persistent and lasts for long periods of time. Anxiety may also occur, occur with other disorders such as depression, um, such as PTSD, um, and some of the other um, disorders that you all may be familiar with. When we're thinking about how to cope and how to manage anxiety, it's very important that you engage in what I just generally call good wellness routine, right? So we want a good sleep hygiene. 
We want a good social support, which the athletes talked about. We also want to make sure that we are um, eating well, but also engaging in activities such as exercise, such as deep breathing and relaxation that we know helps calm the body. Second, when we are talking about treating and working with anxiety, we want to make sure that we unpack our mental story. What is the story that we tell ourselves about what is happening? Phil sort of alluded to this idea of the therapist helping him figure out what was real and fake. Because the thought is that Phil probably had created a story of failure a story of not being able to succeed, a story of everyone abandoning him and, and no longer thinking that he can do these things. And so when you're dealing with anxiety, you really do want to work on that mental story that you have created about the future, knowing that the future isn't written yet. So you are perfectly able to write and have the story that you want. And I always tell my clients, if you are the author of your story, you might as well write yourself being the winner, right? You might as well write yourself coming out on top. You might as well write yourself being the victorious one. And so a lot of anxiety works, works around thinking about that story that you tell yourself, as well as developing behaviors that will support your overall wellness. If any of you all are experiencing anxiety in any shape, form, of course, reach out for a therapist, but also engage with some of those practices that we talked about. Again, good hygiene, good social support, engaging in physical activity that includes not only exercise, but deep breathing. You can also purchase a lot of anxiety workbooks that will walk you through the steps to unpack your stories and unpack some of the way that you may be imagining the future. Um, and I think that that um, is my time. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sharifa. That was just so much of a, of a wealth of valuable information. And I think that you really, you know, nailed some of these ideas and theories down to help people understand what they're experiencing, what anxiety might look like, and I think that, you know, what, from what you shared, we understand that anxiety can be almost a, a reaction to a stressor. And it also can be a combination of a reaction to a stressor where your mind creates a story and almost makes the, the situation uh, elevated or may, puts more pressure on the situation. I think you gave a really great description of all the ways that 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 effect. I'm not even going to say those symptoms because I really want to make sure that we destigmatize mental health and mental health, um, you know, uh, conditions because it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a disorder. It, anxiety is a way of relating to stress. And I think what we're learning from this conversation today is that we all experience stress, even the people that, you know, are champion fighters and that have had a, a ton of, of success experience anxiety, even if it doesn't look like it on the outside. So thank you so much. Thank you. And I just want to add real quick that just because this keeps coming up, this idea of pressure, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of times we think that pressure is motivating us, right? Like we need the pressure in order to be motivated. But what research says is that there's a limit to that. That once you reach a level of so much pressure, what happens is you actually break down. Think about a car, right? If you continue to ram the engine, that gasket is going to blow. It's going to go hot. And we are the same way. So I always encourage us to be motivated by good things, right? I am motivated to train this hard because it feels, it feels good for my body. I am motivated to compete because I enjoy competing. I am motivated to perform and to show up because it actually feels good for me as opposed to letting pressure be a motivating factor because you never know when that pressure is going to be too much. Thank you. And I'm Dr. Sharifa. 
Yes, yes. Thank you, Dr. Shreve. And I think that we saw that both in Angela and in Phil's story. And the people think that once you become successful or once you hit that level of achie achievement that you've been striving for, that the anxiety or the pressure or the stress will actually become less. And so I love that you shared that because I think both Angela and Phil's story shared that, you know, almost once they got to the level, that level, that they might have crossed that threshold where the stress actually and the pressure became more and it, and it, you know, created that imbalance. So I love that. Thank you. And so next, we're actually going to hear from our, the, we're going to hear from our, our final fighter. And he is the future Hall of Famer, seven time world champion, and former WBO junior welterweight champion, Demarcus Chop Chop Corley who's known for his epic battle with Floyd Mayweather Jr. And many believe, including myself, <laughs> that I, I mean, that he was very close to beating him. I, I, I swear that I actually saw you took, take him down and hit him a couple of times. So yes, ma many people believe, me included, that you were very close to beating him. So let's go ahead and take a look at that reel. How do you have it through? <laughs> okay, Jim, three to nothing, 30 to 27, Floyd Mayweather, well, he's in trouble now. Marcus Corley once again catches him and now tries to go to work against the ropes. A right hand sent Mayweather back into the ropes. And now Corley working against a Mayweather who's leaning back against the ropes. Trying to get in something good to the body as Mayweather tries to fend him off while leaning back. And I, I, one thing I'll give Corley credit for, he's trying to take his time. Not throwing up too many punches where he drains himself, trying to wait for a good clean punch. Corley not over anxious. You see Mayweather's getting tired over there on those ropes. <laughs> All right, Demarcus, good to see you. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So can you share with us, Demarcus, about your story with some of the obstacles that you've had to face as a fighter? Oh. I got into boxing just to win trophies. I love to fight. And um, it was an opportunity for me to bring home an, a reward to show my parents that I was able to do something as a little kid. Uh, I took it very serious. I dedicated my life to it at, at the age of 10 years old. And leading up through the amateurs, I had 119 amateur fights. I won 100 fights out of 119. Um, I almost made the Olympic team in 1996 and in 1992, and uh, I turned pro right after 1995, getting ready for the 96 Olympics. Uh, I knew the politics was playing a factor into the sport, so they had their favorites who they wanted to go to the Olympics back then. And I just took my hands and rolled the dice. I got a great manager, which was Sugar Ray Leonard at that time, and he was my mentor leading up me getting ready for my title fights early in my career. Awesome. And what would you say that, so were there any things that you had to face as it relates to mental health challenges, fear or anxiety? And I know that um, you had some adverse situations happen uh, and then you, you, you had to take you know, some time off before coming back. Is there anything around those adversities or you can share? Yeah, I would say the first one would be 1997 when I had a dream that I was in a shootout in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And I get up Wednesday morning and I go to the gym and I tell the fighters about my dream. And then Wednesday night, the dream mm -hmm. come true. It come mm -hmm. true. And uh, it was just a very scary moment for me just to experience me having a dream than to actually have it happen in real life. Uh, I got shot in my spine and in my left leg over an Eddie Bow coat, a big mm -hmm. puffy coat. It was winter time. And um, I immediately um, went to the hospital when I got shot. And I called my manager, which was Sugar Ray Leonard. And I had them to sign a waiver so they can do surgery to get the bullet out my spine and out my left leg. And um, just thinking about what I wanted to do in life, growing up as a kid, I boxed since I was 10 years old. So I just turned pro in 1996 and I get shot in 1997. Mm. It was just like, 
my life is just over with if I'm not able to box because I knew nothing but boxing growing up as a kid. So I made sure that they did the surgery and took the bullet out. But in the process of that, all I could think about was my career, my career, how I'm going to box, how I'm going to be able to finish the things that I wanted to do in life. Mm-hmm. So immediately after I got out of the hospital, which was the next day on Thanksgiving, I got a chance to be home with my mom and my wife and kids for Thanksgiving. And within two days later, I was in the gym, back in the gym. And they was asking me, you shouldn't be here. You just got out the hospital. I said, look, I got to get ready. For what? I have my fight. <laughs> They're like, I don't think you're going to fight no more. I was like, trust me, they took the bullet out. I'm going to fight. So I I had crutches for three weeks. I was on crutches for three weeks and I still went to the gym and I hit the bag with both hands, but I was limping in the process of hitting the bag and stuff. But I just thought about is I'm going to have a problem later on in life. Is these me getting shot? Is it going to do some damage to me later? Because they say bullets, they do travel when you get shot. So that was the main reason why I wanted the bullets out of me. That was a scary moment. So after I got myself back together, I had my next fight within like three to four months after I got shot the following year, 1998. And then um, I looked at life different after that. Mm -hmm. Over a coat, they wanted to take my life. So I just started moving different and I just started surrounding myself with good people pretty much my kids staying outside of the go-go because I used to like to go to the club and party and have a good time Mm -hmm. but um going through that experience it changed my life yeah and I and I love because I think when we think about mental health one of these words that comes up around adverse experiences I mean in getting shot or some having a loved one get shot is definitely one of the biggest you know adversities that we can we can face we often talk about it as a, as a traumatic experience. And then, you know, having this post-traumatic experience that's, that's you know, takes us back, um, that we're not able to fulfill, you know, the goals that we had for ourselves. And I love your story because after you were shot in the spine, you actually not only came back, but you went on to win the w, WBO junior welterweight title. And so yours is a story of resilience, of being able to take something adverse, challenging, devastating, and and come back. And so before we hear more about how you did that, we're actually gonna show that, that clip of when you won the world title. All right, fans, here we go. 12 rounds of boxing for the WBO Junior Welterweight Championship of the World. Introducing to you first on my right, he is fighting out of the blue corner, wearing red trunks with yellow trim, hailing from our nation's capital of Washington, D.C. He weighed in at the junior welterweight limit of 140 pounds even. His fine record stands at 25 wins, one loss, one draw with 15 wins coming by way of knockout. He is ranked the WBO number 10 junior welterweight contender. Introducing uh, DeMarcus, Chop Chop Corley. Mitchell, he fought well. His last, oh, down goes Flores on a right hand, and he gets up. Now it's Flores, chasing the canvas, a left hand down for the second time. There's no three knockdown rule, and he is on wobbly legs. He tells Jay Nady he's all right. Corley, as mentioned, and his camp said this was going to be a quick run. This is going to do it. Wow. Nady stops the fight. In the first- Ladies and gentlemen, we have the time of two minutes, 49 seconds in round number one. Our referee in charge, Jay Nady, stops the contest. The winner by way of technical knockout, he is the new... WBO Junior Welterweight Champion of the World, DeMarcus Chop Chop Corley. (laughs) Did it take you back? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) 
that's a happy moment. I mean, it, that's the happiest moment of my life right there. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. I never forget it. Well, I'm going to tell you, just watching it, I could, I can feel it too. And I feel like I was right there with you. And I, I don't know if you see the chat, but you know, there's just some people showing some respect for you right now, for you and for your resilience. And so I just want to acknowledge you um, and for your journey and for you as a fighter. And I know that we didn't actually get into this topic yet because we've been talking more about anxiety, but I understand that you might have had some experiences with depression. Is that? Yeah. Okay. So do you, do you think you could share a little bit about that? Because that's not something that we've really touched on today. Uh, so share about your experiences and then any advice that you have to our audience, to other fighters about how to cope. Um, my experience with that, everybody cope with things different. And for me, boxing saved my life because without boxing, I wouldn't be here today because I would have been in the streets doing something that I ain't had no business doing. But I fell, I fell in love with the sport of boxing and it kept me off the streets. Um, everybody deal with things different. Boxing helped me deal with my depression when I lost my mother in 2015. Um, my mother was like my, my rib. Mm. She taught me everything. I didn't have a father in the house. So I was a mama's boy. Out of three boys, I was the youngest one and I stayed up underneath my mother. So everything she taught me, she said, look, one day you will not have a woman. I said, I'm gonna have a wife, I'm gonna get married. She said, but she may not know how to cook. She mm. said, I'm gonna show you how to do everything in the house that a woman should do. Clean, cook, wash, everything. She said, but you also got to know how to do men's stuff also. So I was a handyman. And I look at myself as a jack of all trades. I can do a lot of things. And, yeah, and I know, I know that you actually got got another come in in the kitchen. We've got some. Uh, you've got some. <laughs> that's you're not called chop chop for nothing. <laughs> 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 that's right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Here's your promo moment. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I, my, my, my mom, she really instilled in me to do the right things in life and to stay away from trouble. Mm -hmm. And um, going through that depression when I lost her, I didn't, I didn't want to be here no more. Even though I had my wife and my children, my kids, just not having my mother, she's here with me in Vegas. We was, she was cremated. Her birthday is coming up August the 1st, next week. Um, I just didn't want to live because I knew without her, how was I going to make it? But I knew she said, look, I'm not going to always be here, but I'm going to help you so you can make it when I'm not here. But I never thought she would leave so early. And my way of dealing with it, I made a phone call to my manager at that time. And I told him I need to get away. And he said, what you mean get away? I said, I just want to go somewhere where I just don't have to think about nothing. And I just want to box. I just want to just work, work, work. So he sent me to California and I was in camp with another fighter who was a world champion. His name was Lama Chinko. He's from Russia. So I went to California and I worked with him, getting him ready for an upcoming fight. And that was my way of dealing with my depression. I took a lot of beating from him but I just didn't think about the loss of my mother mm -hmm. being gone. I was just there, just running, training, spine, and I was, my nose was bleeding every day. And they were like, Chuck, what's wrong with you? You okay? And I was like, I'm just going through a lot, man. Don't worry about the blood. I mean, I bled for like two weeks every day. Wow. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's interesting, the body, you know, sometimes when you have something going on on the inside, it will come out in, in some type of symptom that doesn't really, you know, make sense to what you might think of would have caused it. And so, you know, it could stress. be nosebleeds. Yeah, stress can cause nosebleeds every day. And, you know, I, I, what I really admire about your story is that, you know, no one probably saw what you were going through on the inside. And I think that's just been a, a theme that we've seen today is that you were, you were winning fights, you were a champion fighter. And 
you were fighting every day. You won a hundred out of 119 fights, yet you might have been experiencing at that time losses, being shot, depression. So we we don't know what's going on on the inside based on how someone's showing up. And so I really just admire and respect you sharing your story with us today. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So now we're going to tie things up. And we're going to hear from mental health therapist, Amin Watson. And so we'll go ahead and bring him on now. Hello, hello, hello. How's everyone doing? All right. Doing good. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. Uh, my pleasure. So my name is Amin Watson. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and uh, the executive director of Healthy Lives. We do uh, mental health, substance abuse treatment, working in the behavioral health field, as well as working with some developmentally disabled. Um, so let's talk about depression. So what is depression? Depression is what we assume it to be, sadness, hopelessness, and depression is one of those things that we've all kind of felt at some point. Um, some of us may be going through it now, but what is the difference between the depression that we speak about locally amongst our friends and amongst our family and depression that might be considered an issue that's uh, that needs some, some, some more attention than just what's, you know, closer next to you. And that will probably be in, intensity and severity and a length of time. So sadness and hope, hopelessness, it comes. Um, you lose someone, you lose a fight, something happens, it can trigger those feelings, right? When do those feelings go away and how intense are those feelings? Are you able to get up the next day and go to work? Are you able to address uh, the issues or the things going around amongst your family with your children, et cetera? So these are the things we wanna think about when we're trying to understand what depression is, because uh, it affects you in that manner. It's hard to, I think one of the fighters actually mentioned, yes, it was Mr. Davis, I think it was, Phil. He mentioned uh, having difficulty going to class, let alone actually training for it for his events, he, had, he actually had difficulty going to class. So what that also says is that some of the symptoms of depression are similar to the symptoms of anxiety, which we've all talked about as far. A number of the fighters spoke on that. So we want to have a better understanding of what depression is because of the way that it impacts you. Not being able to take care of your family, not being able to take care of your household needs, these things can really debilitate you as you try to move forward in life. Uh, there are a lot of things that can happen to us as a result of the depression, homelessness, uh, sickness, illnesses, the whole nine. So what are some other symptoms of depression? Let's talk about that as well. Sleeplessness, I'm sorry, lack of sleep, uh, appetite is affected, angry outbursts. We have a slide here with a number of, of options for you to look at to determine what kind of things apply to uh, depression. So let me also say this, uh, this additional information is that depression can look like however it needs to look, look like for you. It's not a textbook way. You can't just go down a list and say, are these things happening? Because for one individual, depression can be a lack of sleep. For another individual, depression can be too much sleep. For one person, it can be no activity. For another individual, it could be too much activity. So it can look like however it looks for that specific individual. Now, how do we deal with depression? Once we identify that we have some issues that we want to address, that we want to get some assistance with, um, we want to reach out for help. Depression is not something you want to deal with alone. Of course, the most severe consequence of depression is suicide. We don't want to take that lightly. So we want to deal with depression with some help, call and get some assistance from a therapist, from a psychotherapist, from a doctor, et cetera. There's a new hotline out now that's just been put out, 988. It is a suicide and crisis hotline. You can call them and get some assistance. And we really want you to make sure that you reach out when you need to, to get the kind of help you need when dealing with depression. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think that that's really good because I think in this 
symposium, we've talked about the different ways that some of the most common mental health challenges, depression, anxiety can show up, what that looks like on the less severe side and what that looks like on the more severe side, as well as some of the more unexpected ways that those things can show up. And so I really appreciate just the, the practical uh, understanding of depression. Thank you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're gonna wrap up soon. So I'm just gonna give anyone out there that has a, a question that you wanna ask to either one of the fighters or one of the, pri the providers that's in the symposium right now, you can put your question in the chat. And I know that there was already one question uh, that I think that we had for DeMarcus. And so I'll go ahead and DeMarcus, I, if you're still on here, I'm gonna bring the question to you, which was, uh, the question was, what did you do to help deal with the loss to Floyd Mayweather Jr.? You still on here, Demarcus? Did oh, are you gone? Is, is he gone? Okay, I don't see him. Okay, so if I, if he if he's gone, let's go ahead and just move on to another one. So, Angela, since you're still on here, I want to see if you could talk to us about if you still have like because. Uh, you're still fighting, and I want—I would love to know, like, has anxiety transformed? Like, does it look different now than it did before, and and how do you deal with it? Um, yeah, it's. I think, I think before I would feel, you know, pressure, um, pressure to do well, pressure not to lose. Um, and then it changes, it changes to like, once you lose that zero in your record, then it changes to, okay, I'm just, I'm, I feel pressure to show that I'm better than I was when I lost. And then it changes to, okay, now I'm, it, it, I felt like for a while, I kept trying to use the wrong things in order to motivate myself. Um, and in the end, I found out if I'm just working to feel better about how I did today, as opposed to yesterday, then that was the healthiest way to do it. Like, um, not looking for outside, outside sources of satisfaction, sati satisfying, you know, um, not looking to other people to tell me what I'm worth. And I think with uh, with things like uh, social media, with things like um, critics uh, and just, you know, people having access to you that really shouldn't, allowing those opinions to, to dictate my self-worth, I think that really hurt me a lot in, in my mm -hmm. career once I got into the limelight. And... Now, I think the anxiety is just wanting to perform my best. And uh, it, it, it's different every time you go out there. Uh, some days mentally you feel strong, you feel untouchable. Some days you're just nervous the entire day. You have butterflies in your stomach. Um, you're, you're sweating. You have, you have like those heart pings every five seconds. And I feel like it's not... Once, once you're in there, it's pretty much the same every time, but it's just that buildup. I always say fight day is the longest day <laughs> of that week because every second you feel it pass and you're just waiting for this thing to happen that you prepared a long time for and you want it to go well, but so does the person you're fighting. Um, so I think I just understand it now better uh, where before I would be surprised that I had dry mouth, you know, <laughs> like, why do I, why do I feel so thirsty? Or I'm surprised I have to go to the bathroom about 10 times uh, in an hour. And I'm just like, what, what is happening to me? But now that I understand 
um, I guess the symptoms of anxiety. I understand uh, what my body's going through, how my brain can affect my body and, you know, levels of stress can affect your health and all that stuff. It, now I'm more conscious of trying to keep it at bay. And I do use breathing exercises a lot. I use meditation a lot. Um, and, and just trying to stay in the moment, especially on those really hard days, like competition day, just stay in every moment, not think too far ahead or not dwell on the past. Little things like that have helped me deal with it. Um, but I feel like anxiety still feels the same physically. Um, it's just understanding it makes it a lot easier to deal with where before I was just like, oh my God, am I not ready? Like, why, why do I feel this way? Why am I so nervous? Is it, is it because I didn't train hard enough? Is it because um, I don't deserve to fight this person who's really good? And it's like, no, this is just what the best athlete in the world would go through. You know, like this is what anyone would go through. Um, yeah, understanding the beast helps it be less scary. Absolutely. And I, and I love what you, what you said about anxiety, because it, it still feels the same in your body. And, you know, the healthiest, the best person, the best fighter is still going to experience anxiety. And it doesn't mean that you have to take medication or you have to go to therapy even. It means like by becoming more aware of it, you can make the experience uh, less problematic or less invasive in your life. And you can also just shorten the amount of time that it impacts you. And it sounds like you've learned to do all of those things. And, you know, you share it again today. And I know you mentioned yesterday, which I think is just so important. You said yesterday that you had to really turn down the noise from the outside mm -hmm. world and that that was really important uh, for you being able to cope. And I just think that that's such an important message because I think that we don't even acknowledge when you have so much recognition, so much fame, that there's a value to turning that down. And yeah. so I appreciate you sharing that. And then I also, there's just so many gems in there. You said that <laughs> you were doing the wrong things to motivate yourself, which is actually the definition of self-sabotage. Mm. And people think when you're like, if you hear that term self-sabotage, you're trying to sabotage yourself. You, you, you're like subconsciously trying to set yourself back, but there, you're actually usually not we're trying to motivate ourselves mm. in doing the wrong things or doing something that's not, that's creating another problem while we try to motivate ourselves. So I just thought that that was just a gold mine of value for you to share that. So thank you. Hey, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's hear from uh, DeMarcus. I don't know if you came back, but I got one for Phil. If you're here, I see you here, Phil. So we would love to hear from you, like what you're currently up to and what you're doing in your, in your career field. Um, so right now I'm, uh, I'm doing a lot of coaching. I, I coach wrestling in a local high school uh, that is both stressful and therapeutic. <laughs> uh, I also coach uh, uh, a group of uh, pro athletes. I, I coach them in the wrestling side of mixed martial arts. Um, Angela Hill being one of them, star, star student. <laughs> right, right. Um, she recognized you as one of her inspirational trainers and coaches. Right. And, um, you know, a big part of that is, um, you know, the coaching side of it is just finding those areas where, you know, you feel so confident. Like I, I always say, as soon as I am grabbing someone then I can begin wrestling and I feel so confident that I can take take the level down in a fight so uh in my coaching I that's one of the things I try to focus on just having strong positioning and uh help work my my athletes to get to those positions that they win every time so uh doing that and uh hopefully preparing for a fight this fall awesome awesome well we will look forward to seeing you and I love what you said about position, because I think that you're talking about position, you know, as a fighter, as a wrestler. Um, and I think that there's also a way to position yourself mentally in your mindset. And I think that some of the tools that you offer and some of the other fighters and some of the other mental health providers out here are offering people today is a way to position yourself in a way where you set yourself up with a foundation that creates stability and resilience and right. the opportunity for you to really be able to 
to reach your potential and and to be able to stay up once you get there because you're going to get there thank you thank you yeah absolutely so thank you all so much for joining us today and i really hope that you all will join us for our next symposium and thanks again to adc for hosting and we'll see you all next time thank you miss stanley yes thank you thank you